I used to hear callings because we sit at the fire at night. I was deer hunting up in uh, the UP. I was working on a cabin in the woods. We hear some uh, weird noises in the back of our house. We, we're all surrounded by woods, you know, and, uh, and green fields. The crazy things go up back there. I went and I just barely turned and I heard this <laughs> and I hear thump thump. That kind of, at that point in my life, it kind of reinforced the idea that there might be something out there. All right, we're here with Doug, and we are, again, we're at uh, Bigfoot Days out here in West Branch. And Doug, we just want to ask you why you believe in Bigfoot and kind of what started your belief in Bigfoot. Okay. Well, as everybody probably watched some of the shows and all in the past, I grew up in the 70s, so there was a lot of movies to watch. and. Uh, so I got out in the woods more, and then eventually I just had where there's more experiences, like noises and things you heard, and like the howls you hear. And then with the internet came out, there's just a wealth of information. So once I watched a lot more internet stuff, you're like, there's got to be something to this. And then I started going to conventions, and it just made me more of a believer. I haven't had an experience where I've seen one, but I've had where I've had experiences with sounds and things in the woods. So that's really what's kind of hooked me. Yeah, so tell us a little bit. Of, you said that you've had an encounter with Bigfoot. You've seen him. I've had quite a few encounters. T tell me a little bit about that. Um, I was working on a cabin in the woods and hammering at night and stuff. And across the road, I shine deer on the way in to go work in the cabin after I get off of work. And uh, they were out there chasing deer. I had four lined up along a wood line at one point. I didn't, you know, I was like, what is that? Didn't really know. And then one was balled up out there, I think crawling sneaking up on the deer and then uh you know this is over a matter of years and then i had the geese were going crazy so i got my spotlight out and two of them jumped up from the farm pond one with a goose in his hand and uh had lots of lots of experience i've seen them at 20 yards of the spotlight now um a female and a little one and uh then i saw a big one on a, on a creek crawling. I thought it was a bear. Got my binoculars out at 50 yards in the daytime. Stood up and looked at me. And it walked off. And then uh, the next day, somebody had a report. Bigfoot sighting, same direction it was walking. And it's on the Bigfoot BFRO Bear Den Lake incident. So if somebody wants to look it up, they can. But I was, the day before I seen it, yeah, so kind of confirmed everything for me. That's awesome. And how long have you kind of been, you know, I mean, when was your first sighting? How long was it? Uh, probably about 12 years ago now. Now, did you believe before that or was it? Interested me. I, I, I never had anything definite. I've had some yeah. weird things. Yeah. But now I've gone to the, I pretty much got it figured out, I think. So. That's awesome. You know, you, you believe in Bigfoot, obviously, correct? Yep. Okay. So how long have you believed in Bigfoot, and kind of what was your first reasoning or experience well, for believing in him? You know, I mean, I, I was, I'm always a big hunter, yeah. you know, yeah. and so uh, things in the woods didn't make sense to me sometimes, and so, of course, back then I didn't really know what, you know, you didn't really hear about Bigfoot too much, so... Then, you know, I had a couple experiences that, that I thought maybe was real, and I did some research on it, and I, you know, if the Indians saw it, uh, people in different countries or different, you know, all over the world seeing the same thing, and that's when I started to believe. And, you know, some of my experiences were, you know, me and my son, we were, went for like about a five, ten mile hike out in the woods, hunting, deer hunting, and uh, we we got to this really strange area and started seeing shit, and we started smelling something, and I said to my son, I goes, man, something's going on here, and we stopped, no sooner than we stopped, a deer jumped up right in front of me, and normally a deer would never let you get that close. For some reason, that, that deer was staying there, and we could smell tremendous pungent odor and so that was kind of the first time and then I was deer hunting up in uh, the UP uh, way back in some truck trails and me and my buddy 
when we pulled around the bend, we, there was a big wide opening and there was something roaming across the field. And, you know, we couldn't see it. We didn't have our binoculars with us because we were getting into camp, you know. And we watched it across the field. And it, it was either a moose or a Bigfoot, you know. So, um, and then a couple years ago, me and the family, we, we took my Jeep way up out in the backwoods and we parked and my son wanted to uh, go swimming, but he had to go down this big creek. So he went down there and jumped in the water and I did a Bigfoot call. What does that sound like? Well, like a big scream. Now, you wouldn't want me to do it right now. It scared the shit out of everybody. Yeah, oh yeah. So, so when I did that, <clears throat> something screamed back, you know. Now we were all back at him. And uh, I had a couple little my nephew, uh, grandsons and granddaughter there. They got scared, so I turned the jeep around, and just for yucks, I did it again. And that thing was right at the bottom of the hill, screaming back. And two minutes earlier, ten minutes, you know, five minutes earlier, he was across the water. So he made some tracks fast, whoever it was. And the kids got, we got to go. And they started crying. So I jumped in a Jeep and drove out. So those are my experiences with them, you know. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm a believer. And then you, yeah. you don't believe in Bigfoot. Well, I believe in it. You know, I watched all the, the shows on it and stuff, you know. And I believe that there's something out there. There's something out there, you know, because, like you said, people see it. And, but, uh, you know, I watched, you know, all the shows that they have on TV on about it. And, um, of course, I've never, you know, been like him, you know, but <clears throat> I still believe that there is something there. Or people see it, you know. Um, that's all I really can say. With me, yeah, you, you, you know. said you dragged him into it. Well, yeah, and, and we we brought our camper, so we're camping uh, out up up down here, and we'll go out for a walk about tonight, and see if we can hear anything. Are you guys gonna be there or no? The walk yeah, yeah, we're tonight? yeah we're gonna walk around. Yeah. Oh, cool. So we'll see you there tonight. At the horse camp. Awesome. At the horse camp, you guys are gonna be. I yeah, I guess so. Yeah. yeah we're not camped there, but we're gonna show up later this tonight. Walk around. Hi, I'm Mike, and we came out here to Whitehall, New York, looking for Bigfoot, and we found the Bigfoot Sasquatch Calling Festival here in Whitehall, and we're excited. It's everything Bigfoot. we got experts, vendors, you name it. I can't wait to mix it up and uh, talk to everybody. Tell us a little bit about what this means to the community on just this whole Sasquatch Festival. Yeah, so this is a really, really special day for our community. This is the biggest event that we have ever had here in Whitehall. Um, we have volunteers who work tirelessly all year round um, to make this festival a success. And what it means for our community, it means uh, you know it brings a lot of economic opportunities um, for our our small rural community. Um, businesses have actually told me in the past that this festival has kind of saved them from going under, which is a really you know that's a really great feeling. So. Um, it really is very impactful for the community. We have so many vendors here, a lot of small businesses, so we really are trying to support them and make it as, um, as, as great of an experience. Could you tell us a little bit about why the attraction to Whitehall with Bigfoot? Like, what's, 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 what's the hubbub? What, yeah, why? Whitehall's a hotspot. Whitehall's a Sasquatch hotspot. There was a sighting just as recent as July this past summer. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's just a place where a lot of things have happened. A lot of, a lot of unexplainable things have happened throughout the years. Um, just brings a lot of mystery to Whitehall, and I think people really enjoy coming in and unlocking those. Uh, my name's Kaysen Claremont, and I actually come right outside of Saratoga Greenfield, uh, just south from here, an hour. Okay, an yeah. hour, hours away, so yeah. you're kind of local. Uh, yeah, this is my fourth time coming to the Sasquatch really? Festival. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and my family over there, we make it a yearly uh, thing to just come down. And my brother actually there is a Bigfoot Squatch man right here. All right, all so, right. Yeah. Uh, 
He comes down and he drags us down here every year. We love it. Absolutely Have love it. Have you seen a Squatch? I've not seen Squatches, but however, I'm talking to like people like Steve and all the evidence that they have with the pictures, I mean... Any, yeah. any run-ins, any things that you think that could have been a Squatch? Or? I mean, we hear some uh, weird noises in the back of our house. We, we're all surrounded by woods, you know, and, uh, and green fields. The crazy things go up back there, so oh, you don't know if it's a Sasquatch or... Well, you got a lot of wilderness out here. Oh, absolutely. So, Hills and whatnot. So I can imagine that... Um, kinds of critters uh, yeah i don't i don't blame them you know up in whitehall too it's, it's beautiful over here i mean just over there you know the hill and it's changing colors and whatnot um so how are you enjoying the, the fair today the fair is great uh you know all the vendors here there's so many vendors you know the last time there wasn't this many vendors uh I, i'm excited for the calling co contest today we just have oh, the number uh, seven i'm number seven number seven yes. all right where do i sign i'm gonna sign up oh, today sign up right on this outside row one of those um, uh-huh yeah you can't kind of can't miss it. they they're wearing pink shirts so yeah no oh, i i got gotcha. yeah, sure, you i'm i'm ex buddy. i'm excited have you have you seen a squatch sadly no no come here come here so what do I do? You just talk into it. Yep, just talk into it. Uh, personally, no. One time I thought I did, but I uh, it was just a it was just a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But honestly, I thought it was for a time being. I still don't know what it was, but I I was chilling out back on uh, on our little deck, right? Uh -huh. And uh, I just hear this noise. It's like a loud loud noise. Sound like it was coming from the woods, but it also sounded like it was from the road as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was like this loud, prolonged noise. It went on for like a good 15 seconds. And then once we hear that, we give calls right back. We actually practice calls. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can, we give you, can we give you a few? Would you give us a couple calls? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Here, All you right. do yours, and then I'll, I'll, I'll do mine. All right. Oh! Oh, see, now I don't think I can top that. Here, I'll try mine. I'll try mine. Come on, bro. Come on. Oh! Yeah. Right, I, like I gotta warm up for the contest this nice. evening, you know? <laughs> you know? Sign up. Yeah. Um, so how are you enjoying the day? Good. Yeah. Oh, fun. it's beautiful. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful. What's your favorite day. part? My favorite part? Just meeting all the people and yeah. all the information that they have, you know? It's yeah. just. It makes me one step closer to thinking that you know there is a Bigfoot actually do out you, there. Do you hunt and go out? And I don't. I, I don't have time I've for that. No, I've no, no, no. A few times. We've been invited times. by yeah. some of the people here. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. To find somebody. To I know, them. right? Yeah. How about right, like hunting deer, hunting uh, uh, fowl, hunting any of that? I've stuff? gone. I've gone uh, hunting a few times with my uncle. Mm -hmm. So far, nothing out of the ordinary. We like shooting porcupines out the trees. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sometimes hunt deer. Okay. Uh huh. You know, we we, we uh, practice. So one day when we find that Sasquatch, you know, maybe we'll just have him laid now, out in a fur hood. Now let me ask you, what if Sasquatch didn't want to be found? Sasquatch and didn't want to be found. Would, yeah. Well, as my shirt, you know, he's ready to ready to hide. He's always yeah. hiding, you know. So much. it's just a matter of when, you now, know. Just one thing I'm concerned about is if they find big, uh, a Bigfoot. And they label them endangered species, and then, then what happens? Uh -huh. so then, which then probably gonna not be. Well, if it's an endangered species, hopefully you know, he'll be in like a nice area where we can go and hang out with him and okay. say hi, you okay. know. Cool. See what he's been up to the all these hundreds of years when we're trying to look for him, you know. Who knows? He might share a story or two. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Love to hear his human sighting stories. Absolutely, so, yeah, yeah. Of, of being scared of us, hiding from us, because most of the time, you know, we're scared of Bigfoot. What was that in yeah. the woods, you know? But I know black bear, we get a lot of black bear where we're at, and they will run as soon as you yell at them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you think Squatch might be that. Oh, he's got to be. He's he can't. Be he can't way. be that much of a people person. No. You know, but no, he's no. He's got to have a brain similar to ours if he's hiding this long. You would think. Uh -huh. yeah, would I think. would actually at least assume. Maybe he's hiding he, for a reason. He actually could even be smarter than us, actually. Come to think about it. If he's been hiding for years upon years, like, this is around good 60 years he's been hiding. Sure. And we only know so much about him. Right. So uh, there's a chance that this could actually be smarter than us. 
Well, if you think about it, if their brain was focused on pure survival and staying hidden, they don't need to learn, you know, social media. They don't. To uh -huh. drive through at McDonald's. Yeah, you know, absolutely. The donuts order. They don't. They have all that extra um, RAM space, I suppose, right, in, in, in their brain to, to kind of do. Yeah, that. just what berries, you know. Yeah. Don't let him sit on or let him sit on the toilet for too long. You know, they don't eat the red berries. So. Well, guys, thank you so much. Hey, for thank you. I appreciate it. it. Oh, and, you know, and, uh, thank you for having absolutely. us. You know, and, uh, yeah, go sign up. I'll, yeah, I will see you yeah, out definitely. There. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, have you seen a big foot? I have not, but I am a strong believer, and so is my friend. I have heard, but not seen. Not seen. Not seen. So you believe they're out there? Absolutely. How about UFOs? Do they come down from UFOs? I believe that they hide in the woods. More a portal than a UFO, oh, per se. Oh, a portal. Yeah. I believe they hide. They now, you guys have a, a Squatch Cup? We're working on one. We're, you, you. we're working on one. We're formulating one. We're getting in the spirit. Not up. You don't have a name tag. Oh. What I heard was you have to just call the Squatch from within. So we were going to practice on the way up. We have had a long journey here, about an hour and a half. Uh, not as much as other people that I have heard. It's a worldwide festival. Uh, however, I'm ready to channel the squatch from within, so I didn't want to practice. I, I needed my, my voice ready. It has to be authentic. Yes. Okay, so you, you're not prepared to give us a squatch call? Can you bring your mic up? Mine up? Yeah. Okay, I'll just talk into mine too. That way we're all doing I'd be willing to give a little, not at full volume. Okay. Okay, back yeah. it up a little. Okay. Don't want to blow anybody's ears out. A little mini right. okay. warm-up. <clears throat> Thank you. I love it. I freaking love it. Um, what more is there to say other than Sasquatch is real? Sasquatch is around. It's local. It's here. It's Let's alive. It. Okay. okay. Oh, that's a good question. Are you guys really? having a good time? We're having sure are. We're having the best time. The best. What we're looking for in the Sasquatch Calling Contest, all three age groups, as the deepest, longest, hardest volume you can get. That, that's, that could be a winner. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Experiences. I know you said you had a sighting with Bigfoot. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, some different vocalizations you've heard, kind of uh, the evidence that you've you've seen or heard, um, and kind of what your your most uh, credible sighting or um, your most credible experience with Bigfoot has been. Sure. So my first encounter with Bigfoot was on Prospect Mountain in the Lake George area of New York. Um, I was there on the off season, early uh, April, and I was with a. a research partner of mine and you know at the time we were really just two friends out hiking um, we weren't you know full blown researchers yet but we're walking down the road it's about six o'clock in the evening and I said hey let's practice our Sasquatch calls so you know we start woo, you know going off with our calls and something starts answering us which was really incredible so that went on for about 15 minutes um, and then we got the heck out of there because we were scared um, now if that happened to me I would have stuck around to see what it was but I think that that was probably a Sasquatch and what validated that were my experiences in Oregon when I was studying there for four months under some really amazing researchers, one of which is my research partner today. So 
out in Oregon, we were in the Mount Hood National Forest in an area that there had been a ton of sightings. People were casting footprints. Um, you know, this research group I was studying under was yielding a lot of evidence out of this area. And so they brought me along to show me. Uh, we were driving down old logging roads where we heard some incredible vocalizations. And I also had an experience where we heard some rock clacking coming from the tree line. And then all of a sudden I heard an ape-like grunt and smelled this very pungent ape-like odor. So I've had a few experiences out there but perhaps the most um, amazing experience I had was seeing one in the middle of the night. Uh, it was uh, almost midnight and we were out on private property that we had um, exclusive access to. And, you know, we're walking around, all of a sudden we hear cracking and crunching and, you know, quietly, but it was definitely there. Something was walking through the woods. And before I knew it, I'm staring into the tree line. The moonlight is beautiful and bright. You could see kind of in between each tree. And I see this huge man-like figure step between two trees, kind of look at us, and then walk off. It was the most incredible experience. And at the time I thought, there's no way that could have been a Sasquatch because it was too big. Yeah. And afterwards, we measured it was about seven and a half foot, which puts it in the range of an adult male Sasquatch. But, you know, in the moment, you just, you can't imagine the size of them until you see one yourself. What would you say, um, obviously there's the story of right here in um, Whitehall, the story of um, the police officer seeing Bigfoot. What are some of the different documentations or, or um, some of the more credible um, evidences you've seen in kind of the Northeast? In the Bigfoot phenomena, we have what I call confirmation sightings. And that's like Cliff Sparks sighting in 1975 at the Country Club. That's like uh, sightings like Dan Gordon's. And uh, not only did Dan Gordon in 1982 see a creature cross the road in front of his police car, he was with another officer at the time, who remains anonymous, who corroborated it. And he took a polygraph. There's almost nothing else he can do to further uh, prove his story. Uh, but there was an incident that took place in 2003, and it was uh, uh, up in the Dresden area. And a couple of Hong Kong nationals, who actually worked in town, were fishing in, uh, up by Dresden and they saw this creature wading through the water at chest level. Well, I said to him, my goodness, I said, what did you guys do? And he said, well, we went fishing. The beauty of that report, the confirmation part of that report is they were from an area where it wasn't unusual to see primate type creatures. So they just sort of schlubbed it off and said, well, uh, you know, we just didn't realize there were creatures in this area. Those are those confirmation sightings. They didn't really know how important their sighting was. And then you can add to that the uh, many castings that have been made, uh, some corroborating being, being very consistent in certain areas done by different researchers. So I, I think there's quite a bit of evidence that this is a real phenomenon. Uh, you had told me you were driving along the highway and you, yeah. you and your wife had saw it. Mm -hmm. And your little one-liner was that you knew it was Bigfoot because you and her had never agreed on anything else, right? That, that's what the boys said. <laughs> <laughs> so, since then, yeah. what has your experience like and what kind of different encounters have you experienced? Well, I think probably the part of it is the, you know, the number of stories out there of things that correspond with all the books I've read. I've read 106 Bigfoot books, probably got 500 to go. But I've also <clears throat> been in the woods where along a river, they've thrown rocks into the river by me. I've heard them walk in the river and talking, I think, at midnight type of thing. Uh, one time they broke a tree off by me when I was by myself, when I walked out the trail and here's a broken tree. Um, one time I was camping up by Luzerne with three other guys and I think I got hit with a pine cone. Huh. And the other two guys were at the campfire and and the other fellow was holding flashlight for me. So, you know, uh, we were a long ways, 30, 40 yards from the wood line, and there was no people. We didn't see any pickups around or anybody else. 
and I don't, they wouldn't have known what we were doing anyhow, but anyhow, got hit with a pine cone, so it's, and then I recorded, I don't know if you guys listened to about seven minutes of what I call a mad ape in Kentucky, yep. and I, I think clearly that was, one guy wanted to say it was coy dog, but I don't think a, any kind of dog could have done what I, I was recording there. So yeah, I've had quite a few experiences actually. What do you say, Phil, to the naysayers or those that aren't that that, that would say you're crazy for believing in Bigfoot? What would I you say, say read a book. Dang it, pick a book. <laughs> it, almost any Bigfoot book. Uh, you know, there's some are better. Dr. Meldrum's book, Sasquatch or uh, Legend Meets Science, probably one of the better ones. But you know, for people to be so positive about something and not make any effort to study it. Yeah. And I really don't care if they believe, but don't be so darn positive unless you're willing to read a book about it and study it. Because if you do any study, you're gonna find out there's a lot of good stories, uh, people that come like something like this, a lot of them got stories yeah. of what happened to them. So, you know, don't, you know, I'm positive they're out there and all over the world, but. I've been studying this for going on 14 years or something like that, so, yeah, that's yep. Incredible. yep. Hey everybody, I'm George. Um, I live uh, about 18 miles, I guess, to the, uh, almost directly east of here over in Prescott, and uh, we've got an 80-acre hunting camp, it's been in our family about 35 years, and um, I decided about three years ago, you know, I was going to move up there and homestead it. Never had power, just outhouse and the big hunting shack kind of barn thing. And um, so the place has kind of been vacant, you know, nine months out of the year, except for when uh, my dad and his buddies and our family and stuff are there bow hunting and whatnot. Um, but nobody's ever really lived there during the summer. So I've had a ton of experiences there. Uh, I guess I'll just... Just to make it brief, um, I'll go with the first one and the last one. So first one that kind of like, you know, I, I wasn't really a full on Sasquatch believer or anything. I had, you know, seen some curious things in the woods and listened to stories and whatnot. I wasn't a disbeliever in any way, uh, but it wasn't really on my radar. Uh, wasn't something I was really thinking about too often. Um, but one night when I initially moved uh, to our property, which was the summer of 2019, um, I would say it was like beginning of August or something, and I had been kind of prepping myself, knowing that the weather's going to change, it's going to start getting cooler, and I got to start thinking about, am I wintering in the barn? And I just had been huddling around uh, this campfire that I just kind of made like my hangout area and we never really had fires there you know um it's a bow hunting camp my dad's a real purist like no one no one slams car doors or anything it's like you do the click and butt bump kind of thing and everybody's really you know and everybody's from downstate you know flatlanders city it's whatever you want to call them um you know so i had to kind of like you know, pay my dues to not be called one of those for a little while uh but I, um, yeah, I was sitting by the fire one evening, and and uh, it was just kind of one of those real starry nights, and uh, and I hear this kind of like low, like a cow kind of sound, like a mong, as about as good as I can get, but it, it was real, real deep and textural, like a cow, and it was off maybe uh, a couple hundred yards to one side of me, and I'm kind of like, oh, I'm trying to think of like where the farms are close by and there's nobody that has cattle right where I'm at and I'm just outside the village of Prescott and we're kind of up on a hill so I can hear sounds um, through some of these kind of like terrain features uh, pretty good and uh, you know, it was off in this big four or five hay fields that there's just never anything in I kind of hear this Whoa, and I'm like huh, what's that and then off say that was at my like 10 o'clock off about my one o'clock maybe 100 yards in i hear another a different toned one kind of boom and i was like oh kind of racing through my mind like somebody's cows got out or you know it's maybe i had a couple beers i was sitting up it was maybe one or two in the morning 
Um, you know, so I start running through my mind of like, oh, what could that be? And then the first one goes back again. And I realized there was like a call and response kind of thing happening and moving towards me. It was getting closer. And then a third one chimed in much closer uh, within like, I would just estimate like 50, 75 yards, meters or so. And I was like, okay, time to go in. And, you know, we've got a big barn that I can button up and, and I just, I got freaked out, but I still hadn't really put, you know, Sasquatch in my mind yet. I was, I was just running through loose cows, uh, like, man, do we have a feral hog problem? What, what could this be? What could this be? And, uh, so I, I went in the upstairs and we have a sliding door balcony kind of thing. And I, and I was tiptoeing and creeping all lights out and, um, and I got my guns out and I laid out on the balcony and I got a pretty high powered assault rifle and a 30, 30, and then my little pea shooter pistol. And I'm laying there and I'm like looking out at our kind of pasture area. And then there's the pine, these really thick pines and kind of those sounds are coming right at me moving. And I, uh, and the thought popped into my head, man, could that be Bigfoot? You know, like if it is, it's multiple. And then the le- and then the next thought was, I was gonna see it come out, see something come out of the woods. I just had this feeling someone's gonna walk right out, and the thought popped into my head: Are you gonna shoot it? Would you shoot it? Would you shoot if you saw this the mythical thing? And I told myself no, and uh, and I had put my phone up. Uh, and hit video record, and I do have audio somewhere in iCloud of, I took a long video, it's just a blackness, and it's got the last maybe two minutes of these sounds kind of moving. Um, so that was, you know, not the most exciting story, but that's kind of what kicked off this uh, kind of flurry of activity over the next three years. Um, anything from, you know, seeing kind of like impressions in the in the soft moss that look, You know, nothing like super definitive, like, man, that looks like a footprint, but, you know, a thousand things can when you're in the woods long enough. Um, And we have our back 40 is uh, primarily swamp, and it's just, it's the bedding area for deer. It's really prime bow hunting kind of area, and it's rare to go down in that area. Um, So over those years, when there's not a lot of people around, I, I was having, you know, some audio experiences. Uh, one night I had, uh something go moo like someone was imitating a cow over here and then about five minutes later i'm like man that was somebody just going moo and then in the middle kind of where those three sounds came from the first time something went just like like looney tunes like the you know bugs bunny or something and i'm like okay i had problems with some locals just making fun of me because they saw a Bigfoot sticker on my water bottle, you know, and I spent a lot of time discerning between uh, my mental state, people pranking me, what I'm really hearing. And then the third one off, off to the right flank, I'll call it, goes, like imitating a coyote. And I was like, ha ha, that was the three sounds I got. And it was humorous. There was no kind of threat to it or anything but uh so fast forward to the last experience now this was uh i would say late july early august of last year 2021 um right in the height of like mosquito season it's just hot and sticky and uh one of my old hippie friends had told me you know long ago in a conversation they were like man if you ever have a sasquatch experience leave them garlic cloves they'll love you forever like if you're in the swamp, like leave them garlic cloves. And it just stuck in my mind. And I always, I was always forgetting when I was at the store. And then one day I was just like, man, I don't know, what could it hurt? I don't, you know, like keep things away. I need some garlic in my life, whatever. So I bought these garlic cloves and I had kind of just had them stinking up my pockets and stuff for a while. And uh, I had some trail cams I had to move in the, out in the swamp and uh, had a big predator problem with uh coyotes you know and i'm very protective of like my my little birds and rabbits and stuff like that i love the small game you know and i'm and the the predator stuff i just kind of like 
I had some predator hunters just kind of really pushing their way onto our property. And I was like, you know, I don't want to take care of my own predator problem. So I kind of reset some of my trail cams in areas that were low uh, that I thought, you know, I might catch, see if there's a coyote bobcat coming through that area. I was all setting these cameras and, uh, and I put one in and I had this pocket full of garlic cloves and I just, I had accepted, um, you know, I've got proof enough from these last couple of years that this is a reality of my life and these beings are real, you know, and I just kind of like come to the conclusion. I really don't want to get a visual because I'm back pretty far back by myself. And I feel like our understanding of a comfortable distance is good enough for me. Um, and when I go back into the swamp alone uh, in the dark, I'm one of the, I don't know if anybody else will do it. I'm just one of the ones dumb enough. Um, you know, it's, it's always feeling of like I'm being escorted or something. And, um, so it was getting kind of, getting kind of dark. It was when the days are really long. So it was probably like eight, eight thirty, and I was getting kind of nervous and I set this last trail camera and the, and the squirrels were going just berserk around me. And I was like, well, so much for being stealthy, you know, it's like call it squirrel war three, they're just chattering and, you know, I'm like, okay, guys, I'm here, you know, you got me. And I'm like, damn, squirrels. And the squirrels have just been giving me hell all summer, red squirrels in my barn. And, and, uh, and I, I came back onto our main trail and I stepped onto the trail and the squirrel chatter just stopped and everything got really kind of silent. And I had like three or four cloves of garlic left and, and into the main body, the thickest part of the swamp where no one really goes um, I, I kind of set a couple of cloves of garlic out and just kind of made a statement like, Hey, these are gifts. Uh, thanks for letting me, you know, just sound like a crazy person in the woods talking to myself and saying things out loud because, uh, through all the research, you know, I'm just kind of figuring like if things do mind speak, that's nothing I really want to experience. So we'll just talk out loud. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I, like, I got enough voices in my head, you know, I don't need another one. Yeah, I would be able to figure out which was which at that point, you know, they probably know that already. But, um, so everything kind of goes silent, and, uh, and I'm like, you know, it didn't really strike me as like that, you know, I've listened to a lot of stories, and that, that silence that people talk about, where just the woods goes dead, and the, kind of the fear projection, I didn't, I didn't really have that, but I was like, oh man, cool, the squirrel's stop chattering you know it was just striking that that they weren't chattering anymore and i found myself in this area that i had been a bunch of times but it just it looked different it was getting twilight kind of this humid fog over the the swamp and and uh just mosquitoes everywhere and I, i'm like okay i gotta leave these garlic pieces and then i hear this this thump behind me i took a couple steps and i turned back over my shoulder and there was like cleanly ripped in half a uh, red squirrel and just the back legs, its tail and its abdomen, like guts hanging out. And I'm like, all right, did a bird, you know, I'm looking up like did an eagle drop it. I was just going through my mind of all these things. And, and it, I was like, oh man, something fast enough to snatch a red squirrel fresh. And it felt like they just went, hey, squirrels bothering you? Look at this, and I was like, "Or thanks for the garlic." Possibly, yeah, yeah. It was kind of like, and I, you know, just this I, like feeling of I, I'm always feeling like I'm being watched out there. I'm getting kind of goosebumps talking about it, and um, you know, and it, it takes a lot to rattle me. Um, I'm, a, you know, I've been uh, in a couple crappy places in the world, rough deployments. Uh, you know, I'm a combat wounded guy and, and I've had my brain rattled a few times. So, you know, I, I kind of like don't necessarily trust myself sometimes when I'm out there. Like, you know, there's times where you can think, you know, a, a black squirrel's a huge buck or, you know, blue jay is something, you know, so I'm always kind of skeptical of things. Uh, so, and I, and it was just getting dark, and I was like, I, I, I kind of came to this conclusion, and through hearing stories, I like, the nighttime's not mine anymore. I don't just aimlessly walk around like I used to um, with one eye shut and just, you know, being out there. But I was in the swamp 
longer than I felt comfortable. And I was like, I got this last little bit of light and I've got to get up to my barn. And it's a, it's a path that comes out and then I hit a bean field, take a left, walk the bean field up, go up the hill, and then I'm back at my barn and it's safe zone. Um, and I, so I turn my red headlamp on, you know, and it shows I shine really good if I see a deer or anything. And when I get up to the bean field, and it's really getting hazy. I get up to the bean field just about maybe 20 yards in front of me, and it looked to be about 10 foot tall, just one red large eye shine. And I just got wide-eyed, and I hit my white light, and there was nothing there. And I turned that light back off and I got freaked out. I was like, all right, I'm out of here. You know, I just started, I was like, thanks everybody for playing along. And I'm just heading on home, heading home. Thanks for letting me give you garlic or whatever. Check my cameras and talking the whole way up. And I get, um, I get up to the barn. It's like huge sense of relief. I'm back in home base. And I, and it, I was like, man, I just couldn't stop thinking about that squirrel and what, type of athleticism it would take to grab a red squirrel you know they're just i mean like a red squirrel if it came running at a full-grown human you're like whoa 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 you know it's they're just squir squirrely for lack of a better word <laughs> uh and and I, I was and i said it out loud i was like hey that squirrel as the relief came in i was like oh that was impressive and right from the valley right behind my barn uh there was a chirp like a, my dad does a squirrel chirp i can't do it but it's like a whistle chirp sounds just like a, when a squirrel does one little blast and it sounded like it was on a pa system just poof, right after i was like that was impressive and i was like all right good night we're going inside and uh i you know I've, I've slept with one eye open for a long time but um i guess to wrap it up you know what I've kind of taken from these experiences that I've been having there is like, I get a strange sense of comfort and I feel like I have a safe place that these beings might travel through. And I would really like to keep it that because, you know, I've been out there by myself for a long time and if anything wanted to hurt me, it had a million chances and obviously you know, I've never laid eyes on anything. I've had some things that I just made the conscious decision not to look at out of the corner of my eye. Uh, but, you know, they could have me at any time. And I feel like we have a little bit of a, an understanding. And, um, you know, people scare me. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, thanks. To, Well, let me tell you one story from about 1979 or 1980. I always keep mixing up those dates, probably 1979. So activity was happening in Hemet, California, and you could think of Hemet, California in between San Diego and Los Angeles. So we developed a rapport with the people that it was happening to, but back in the late 70s, early 80s, everything was a landline phone, there was no mobile phones. So we thought we would go see these people and find out what the latest was in terms of Bigfoot activity in their area. So we knock on the door and nobody was home. And uh, it had rained quite a bit in that area. And in that area, there were no paved roads. It was all dirt roads. And some of the dirt roads were rutted in the sense that if you were to drive a vehicle, it would be easy to get stuck. And so the guy that was with me, who actually drove, his name was Doug Trapp. And so I said, uh, now what? And I said, well, why don't we just look around in this area? Because this is where these sightings and footprints were happening. And so we just stumbled around and I told Doug, I said, you know, Doug, you probably should stop your car and we should get out on foot and just walk because if anything that's bad's going to happen, we're going to get your car stuck and we're not going to be able to get it out. So he agreed upon that. And so we started walking around and walking into like some treed areas where a little creek was. And I'm thinking about maybe 10, 15 feet away. We're both looking at the ground. And I think we saw it at the same time. 
there were tracks. And so I'm still a teenager at the time, and this was my first exposure, and it had rained, so those tracks had been kind of washed on, mm -hmm. but they were still nonetheless big tracks that, to my memory, were about 17 inches long with a big wide heel that seemed to be about three or four inches wide at the heel. And so we started looking around and we could kind of make sense of where this thing had walked. And Doug had some plaster in his car and so we tried to make a plaster cast. We did take photos before the plaster castings, but the plaster was, I think, already had moisture in it. So it didn't do a very good job at setting up and it just crumbled away. So we didn't get a casting, so that was, I guess, our fault. Mm -hmm. I was never expecting to see anything. But that kind of, at that point in my life, it kind of reinforced the idea that there might be something out there because we thought about it on the way home. We had no idea that we were gonna park the car there. We just decided to do it. It wasn't planned. So it's not like someone would have planned those prints to say like, they're going to stop the car here. They're going to look here. Right. We had, we need, it was just an afterthought. Right. So in terms of someone saying, oh, someone planted those tracks and you just conveniently walked up. And I said, there's no possible way because we didn't even know we were going to be there. Right. So that was my first exposure to what we would call physical evidence in the ground tracks. Mm -hmm. From the stories that I've heard, it's almost as if when someone does have an encounter with Bigfoot, they're never really looking. It just kind of happens. Yeah. Do you feel like that's a, kind of a fair assessment? Yeah, I think I think if you go out looking for it and you you do what you know, like any of these TV shows that are that are produced and have personalities in it, you you know, they're out there, they're doing whoops and they're doing tree knocks and they're doing all kinds of stuff to try to elicit a response so that they can record it. I think having talked to a lot of people and read a lot and listened to a lot, it seems that people who just go out into the wooded areas and just be, just do your thing, just go there and if, it, if you're out there to fish, fish. If you're out there to relax and then you know, do a campfire with your family, that's when it seems like those types of things start to make themselves known. Yeah. It's almost like if you're out there with the intent of trying to elicit a response, they're going to don't want nothing to do with it. You know, now you talk about hunting, and I hunted for a while. Um, and this would have been in my uh, mid-40s. I hunted a, a very small piece of property. It was very, very narrow and very long. And it was right outside a... Um, a high school area, to be honest with you, it butted up against a, a piece of farm property. And I did not have permission to hunt the adjacent property. But it was a really interesting piece of property. And for some reason, I would sit on pretty much on the, you know, a few yards, yards off the borderline of the two, two properties. And I would always find myself compelled to look at that property. And you know, there was, there was a regular woods, and then there was a strip of, of pine trees that was rather wide. And then he had a little bit of a worn path, which seemed to be a pretty heavy game trail. And then behind that, there was another short row of trees, oaks, and, and maples. And then beyond that, and this was all a relatively short distance, beyond that, there was some very tall grass and some marshy wetlands. And when you would look at the, the wetland area, you could see where the deer would bed down at the night because you could see all the all the right. the grass was grass, down, yeah. and it just always interested me. Really, for some reason, I don't. And I'm not, I'm not a freak about properties. You know, it's right. just, it's not something I I normally like. Well, I want to go see yeah. that property, and uh, so it was getting pretty late in the day. Had about maybe 25, 30 minutes left of of hunting time, and I set my I set my shotgun down, and I left my my blind it was actually a deadfall a, a tree that was really thick tree that just had fallen over and the the canopy of the tree created a, a very nice uh, blind i left my my weapon there 
and I stepped onto the property that I did not have permission to hunt. And I just wanted to see the property. I just wanted yeah. to walk into it. And uh, so I started walking, and I would say I maybe got maybe 50, 55 yards down this game trail. And as I looked up through the corner of the trees, a little opening in the trees, I, I could see the corner of the house. And I was like, ooh, okay, I'm far enough. So I turned around and I started to walk back. And it was a slow walk. I was, yeah. I was in no hurry. And I don't know, maybe a third of the way back to, to my property, I started hearing footsteps behind me. And I immediately just kind of, I stopped and I made sure that my hands were down at my side so you could see I wasn't holding the weapon. And I was sure that it was the landowner. Right. And I was just waiting for him to light me up. Yeah. I was just waiting for him to just start tearing me apart yeah. for being on his property. And, and he should have, yeah. you know. But he didn't say anything. And I waited there for a second, made sure that I had my, on my hands at my side, and I started walking again, slowly. And after one or two steps, I start hearing step, 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 yeah. crunching in the, the leaf litter on the, on the game trail. And uh, I stopped again. And it took maybe one or two steps, and it stopped. And at this point, I mean, I had already been into Bigfoot for a long time, but Bigfoot was not in my mind at all because I was in a very small town yeah. right outside of... Uh, the property of a, a high school where my kids went to school and uh, it was just and and then it hit me and I was like oh my god this is a huge 12 point buck he smells deer estrus on my yeah. on my clothing and he's following me back to my seat yeah and I was like my heart just started pounding yeah. I'm like this is the biggest deer anybody has ever seen <laughs> I'm gonna be on <laughs> newspapers and magazines and so I, I just, I mean, I started slowly walking again, and I heard crunch, 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 crunch. Eventually get back to this deadfall where my gun was, and I had, a, I had a bucket that I was sitting on. And I never turned around, but now I'm thinking, how am I going to reach my, my shotgun with the least amount of movement? Right. Because I don't want to spook it. Right. So I was able to reach, grab the barrel of my shotgun, I pulled it up like this, flipped the safety off, and in my head I'm thinking, okay, so I'm going to take one step back with my left leg, I'm going to turn at the waist at the same time, it's going to be right there in front of me, I'm going to take the shot, it's going to be in the chest, but he's close enough that it'll go through. Yeah. And I went, and I just barely turned, and I heard this, and I hear thump thump and I, I turned and there's nothing there's nothing and I'm, I'm like looking around and I'm looking for a I'm looking for a big white tail right running away from me and all I ever heard was boom boom I heard two I didn't hear four I didn't hear eight I didn't hear 16 I didn't hear it taking off down the trail right all I heard was thump thump after a really really loud exhale and and I start looking for, I start looking for like twigs bouncing, or a leaf, you know, movement, floating yeah. back down to the, yeah. to the ground or something. And there was nothing, huh. absolutely nothing. And I'm like, what the hell? So, you know, I'm 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 all jacked up. My heart's beating really quick. And again, I'm still not I'm not thinking Bigfoot at all. And I'm like, oh my God, that was the biggest deer anybody would have ever seen. Yeah. And. Uh, so I stepped three steps back into the property that I didn't have permission. I had my shotgun, and I'm looking into the woods. It could have gone far because it didn't, right. you didn't hear it running off into the distance. And I'm looking, I'm scanning, I'm scanning, I can't see anything. Finally, I walk back. I walk out of that woods into the, um, the grassy area that's maintained, and I started walking back down the the row of trees to go back to my car, which was about 125, 135 yards. And I'm walking along the edge of the, the tree line. And as I'm walking, I'm hearing steps in the, in the leaves in the tree line. 
and I have pretty decent flashlight. I pull it off, shining, and it's not completely dark yet. I mean, it's getting there, but and I'm I'm shining the light in there as I'm walking, and and I can hear it. Mm -hmm. I don't see a damn thing. There's there's no squirrel. There's no deer. There's no turkey because there's a lot of turkey right. roost in that area. It's and it followed me two-thirds of the way to my car, and then it stopped. But when I got very close to the back of the garage, that the house yeah. that was on that property, that's when it, that's when it stopped. Yeah. So it didn't, go, it didn't go beyond that into, and it wasn't until a couple of years afterwards where I started kind of putting it together, and it's like, that's why, you know, like with my show and you know, really big shows like Sasquatch Chronicles or listening yeah. to Steve Isdall on, on YouTube when he e reads emails from people who have had experiences. It's, it's constant, um, constantly putting together what you've heard right. that makes sense. Yeah. And, and he always calls them puzzle pieces, and, and literally, literally they are. Because it was kind of all at once that it dawned on me. It's like, okay, so I had... I had two footsteps behind me. It didn't sound like a horse trotting. It didn't, you know. Right. And if you listen to a deer walk and a horse walk, it's very similar, yeah. other than the the clip clop yeah. from the the hooves. Um, when you add two extra legs into it, it doesn't sound like a human walking. Right. And this sounded like I, you know, at first I honestly I thought it was the landowner, and and then I convinced myself that it was a deer, but. It was always just crunch, 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 yeah. crunch, crunch. And it wasn't until a couple of years after that that I kind of put it all together and I was like, yeah, was no. it, was it? Yeah, wow. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know, but when you start hearing, and, and I guess you can, you know, I guess it's easy to draw a point from A to point B without it being true, right. but Sometimes, like the simplest answer, is it's the too obvious. is the right answer. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. if you try to if you try to read too much into it, you're possibly missing missing what's there. So I'm not saying it was a Bigfoot, but it, could. it, it was really odd. All right, we're here with David, and David, you told us that you have seen Bigfoot. And uh, it's a long story, but you're going to give us like the trailer version, correct? Exactly right. Okay, here we go. I'm going to try to do this as quickly as I possibly can. This happened in the summer of 2015. I live near Boston. It happened in a town called Weston on Church Street. I've lived there my whole life, never saw it before, haven't seen it again. Driving over this small bridge over an abandoned railroad track, I was driving with my girlfriend at the time and my sister. Someone told me, look down. There it was, standing on the edge of the abandoned railroad tracks. It wasn't standing behind a tree or in the woods, it was right there. At least eight feet tall, 450 pounds. Just standing there watching that occasional car go over that bridge. Driving over the bridge, I said, you guys, did you see that? And they were too busy talking, two women. They're like, see what? I made a U-turn. We parked right there. We watched it for a good five minutes. Here's the most... <laughs> this is... I can't even talk because I get too excited about this. But here we go. This is how I know it wasn't a bear standing on two legs. And I know it wasn't a guy in a costume, because here we go. I saw it plain as day. Again, it was about 75 feet away, down below us. And we're sitting in the safety of our car. My sister, to this day, said she saw a silhouette of it. And I hate to use the word blurry, but she saw like a blurry silhouette of the same thing that I saw perfectly. My girlfriend at the time didn't see it at all. We all had the same exact view. How do you explain that? Here we go. I've always believed. It shows itself to you if you believe in the thing, okay? My sister's always been right down the middle of the road. She kind of saw it, but she didn't see it. My girlfriend at that time never believed in ghosts, aliens, or Bigfoot. She didn't see it at all. Three different experiences with the same exact view. That fits like the perfect jigsaw puzzle piece, okay? So in other words, you could probably walk right by the thing Unless you might smell it, okay? <laughs> you wouldn't even know it was there if you don't believe in it. Well, so. well, let me ask you this. So, I grew up deer hunting, as you do in New England. And um, one of the things that 
I noticed when I would deer hunt is I would see things that I thought were a deer or bear or whatever, right. but it wasn't. Sure. So, I mean, you said like if, if you want it to see it, you'll see it. Or yeah. Yeah. do you think that sometimes maybe you think you see something because you want to see something? Well, I wasn't even looking for it. It's something just told me, look, as I drove over the bridge and it caught my eye. Again, it was like eight feet tall, 450 pounds, okay? So, like I say, it was weird. The whole thing was, it's life-changing when you have this kind of experience. And I know what I saw, and I can't say this enough, I don't do drugs, I wasn't drinking, and I'm not delusional. I'm a little out there, I've seen a lot of stuff in my life. Sometimes with people, sometimes by myself. But trust me, this was the most intense moment of my life, and I'm now I'm 63 years old. That it was the most intense five minutes of my entire life, and I've seen a lot of things and been a lot of places. But that is absolutely true story. Take it to the bank. And uh, at the time, were you convinced it was Bigfoot, or did you kind of have to think about it a little bit more? It was 100% Bigfoot, man. I mean, it was the brown fur, dark brown face, longer arms. It wasn't jumping around, but you could see it was alive. It was just standing there. Like I say, it was just curious about that occasional car that was going over the bridge. Again, this was in the town of Weston, Massachusetts on Church Street. And now today, it's a very popular rail trail. And when I go over that bridge, what, I, what do I see? All day long, there's people jogging, running, rollerblading, but usually when the sun's going down, just the same time I saw it, there's usually a, a very young, pretty girl with headphones on by herself going down that rail trail. I would not be doing that if I was her, if she'd seen what I'd seen. I don't think so. Okay. Do you, think, do you think Bigfoot would eat her? Like, do you think Big... Let me ask you this. Do you think Bigfoot is harmful? Is it just trying to let, let us live our life? Is it trying to live its own life? That's a very good question. I think just like in the real world, there's good people and bad people. And I think this... I think some... Big feet, big foots, whatever you want to call them, are just curious and they don't mean you any harm. Whereas others, maybe not so much. Okay, I think this one was just just wanted to like see the cars. You know, it didn't mean any. It was just curious. It was just standing there like it had never seen cars before. And then, uh, do you think that Bigfoot has any like supernatural powers at all? Yeah, well, like, this the ability how I could see it and my girlfriend couldn't see it at all. And she's looking at me like I'm crazy, and I'm looking at her like she's crazy. It was like, how can you not see it? It's like right there. <laughs> it's like, so what are you going to do, you know? Well, I appreciate you telling your story. Um, like I say, it was a pleasure. And like I say, also that summer, I learned so many years later, one of the Weston police saw the same thing on the other side of town in a swamp. Okay, so I saw it, and a cop saw it. So there you go. Take it to the bank. Right out. Awesome. Thank you, man. Thank you.